Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining. My name is Michael Del Castillo, Senior Editor of Forbes, where I help oversee our blockchain and cryptocurrency coverage. Here with Tuong V. Lee, the partner and head of regulatory policy and crypto policy at Bain Capital Crypto. Tuong V, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, you know, we have a little bit more time on this show to get to know our guests on a slightly different perspective than I think some of our audience is used to, and frequently some of our guests uh, are used to talking about. Um, in fact, we, we, when, we, when we can, we like to go all the way back to the beginning. So what I'd like to start off with, before we get into all the fun stuff about uh, Coinbase lawsuits and Binance lawsuits. Let's go. Where were you born? So, <laughs> tell me a little about where I, you were born and what was it like <laughs> around the dining room table as a kid? What did you guys talk about? Yeah. So, um, I was just thinking, like, not a lot of people know this story. I haven't okay. shared it with like cool. We <laughs> you know, love a lot that. of people that I work with and stuff. Um, so, I was born in a Red Cross refugee camp, actually. Okay. Um, you know, like tens of thousands of other Vietnamese in, I don't know, like the decade or so following the end of the war. My parents um, left on a boat in the middle of the night uh, along with their families and I think there were like 200 other people on this, on this small wooden boat that my mom's father built. He was actually in the business of boat building, which I guess turned out to be really useful. Um, for that situation. But they left in the middle of the night, they escaped. They were at sea for like 10 days. Um, in a boat your dad built? My mom's dad's. Your my, mom's dad My built. grandfather. Okay, okay. Um, and were kind of just drifting. Um, they were attacked by pirates. They ran out of food and water. They thought they were going to die. Um, and then a Singaporean Navy ship uh, found them and hauled them to a Red Cross refugee camp in a little island called Galang okay. in Indonesia. Okay. So not too far from, from Singapore. Okay. Um, so they were there for about a year and they were newlyweds <laughs> at Aww. the time. They actually they actually escaped to Vietnam about a week after they got married. Wow. So my, my dad was a doctor, my mom was a nurse, and they met in a hospital in Saigon. Um, and they got married and left about a week later and, and so they were at this refugee camp for about a year um, where I was born. So cool. you do the math. <laughs> um, sorry if that's TMI. So yeah, I was <laughs> conceived and born there um, and they got word a few weeks after I was born that America had accepted them for resettlement. So my parents and, and my mom's family came to America. What a great a story. <laughs> so um, do you have like dual citizenship? Do you get to like claim Singaporean citizenship? How does that work? Um, I don't think so. I okay, like okay. Ones. okay. I still, I, so I still have my birth certificate. It looks like, it's so funny. It looks, it's on this tattered little piece of paper and I treasure it because I mean, you know, yeah. it's, like, <laughs> it's just like, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, uh, it's sort of an interesting story and it sort of reminds me. Well, the monetary authority from, of Singapore is kind of killing it with the crypto <laughs> stuff today. Are they? Yeah, yeah I know. I'm really, starting to Maybe you that a should bit. look into <laughs> getting that, that dual citizenship um, so you go back and forth. I don't a think later. I do, though. I okay. think, you know, I, I became a naturalized citizen okay. when I was like eight years old. Um, but I should look into that. I've actually never been back there, but I would love to go see oh, absolutely. the island where I was born. What was, um, I, I love I love this, this dinner table question because I think, you know, it, it gets to sort of like some of the life experiences that brings our guests to where they are today. Like, um, first of all, I can't even, like, what was the dinner table, you know? Um, you, you don't have any memories of being in the Red Cross camp, no. but like, when, when you um, finally did make it to the States, like, what, was it uh, more of a traditional Vietnamese setting? You know, were your parents kind of embracing the American lifestyle? Did you guys talk about business? How did you end up from whatever that dining table looked like to where you are today? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, so I grew up in Berkeley and Oakland, okay. California. Um, in a lot of ways, I would say my childhood was pretty like traditional immigrant family. Um, you know, my my parents really did have to start all over mm -hmm. their careers. Um, you know, I mentioned they were a doctor and a nurse. So my mom came to the US um, and basically had to start from scratch. Like she uh, 
went back to school, got an associate's degree at the local community college, and then she ended up opening up a nail salon, which um, a lot a lot of people in the Vietnamese community did that yeah. at the time. And my dad went back to school at UC Berkeley and got a master's in public health and then became a microbiologist um, for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, a job he loved and, and did for many years. Um, so, you know, in a lot of ways, like, I, th I think they were like very traditional Asian immigrant parents in that they expected me to do well in school uh -huh. and, and you know stay out of trouble and all of that but in a lot of ways like ex especially looking back at it now I feel like I appreciate it more as an adult they really weren't like have you ever heard the term tiger parents yes I have yeah so like for our you know, audience that like, doesn't <laughs> know though what is a tiger so parent? it's you know it's a stereotype of a lot of um uh, Asian immigrant parents in the U.S., which is, you know, they push their children really hard, uh, like, you know, uh, including into particular careers, like being a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. And of course, I did end up becoming a lawyer, um, but it was never because they pressured me in any way. Like they, you know, I have memories of when I was really young, like my dad telling me, um, I think it was in a response to a question about like, do I have to stay Buddhist if I don't want to when I get older? Because that was the relig uh -huh. religion I was raised with. Uh -huh. um, and he said, no, you know, you should figure out what you believe in, figure out what you want to do for a living, and pursue your passions and do what makes you happy. So I think you don't, like, people don't appreciate just how radical yeah. <laughs> that was for, like, you know, traditional Asian immigrant parents. Yeah. But both my parents were that way. Um, and like I said, I think in hindsight, you know, as an adult now, I really appreciate that. It's funny, um, in the blockchain crypto world, if you've been around for a while, you've kind of like watched how the industry has changed the way that it talks about itself over the years. Um, and there was one word that used to be used a lot in the space that I hear less often, um, but in preparation for our conversation, I got to listen to a couple interviews that you did, and, and you used this word. Um, it's a word that I like a lot, and hearing a little bit of your backstory, I can't help but wonder if maybe there's a connection there. So, um, we used to talk about blockchain being borderless a lot, um, and less so now. I think especially as regulatory regimes have clamped down and we start to see how every color has its own flavor of regulatory controls. Um, but uh, it was interesting to hear you talk about uh, blockchain being a borderless technology. Um, was that one of the, you know, when you think back to like uh, parents from Vietnam um, being born uh, on an Indonesian island, uh, rescued by Singaporeans, growing up in the United States, um, you have a very borderless background. Um, was that part of the allure that got you into the space in the first place? Or was there something else going on as you were discovering <laughs> when, you, when you went down the rabbit hole? I system? feel like I'm in a therapy session. I've never actually thought about that question, but there probably is something to that, right? And it's, and it's funny that you mentioned that too, because Vietnam, I think, I don't know what the most recent stats are. I haven't looked at this in a long time, but a few months ago, I was looking at this report and Vietnam is actually the number one country in the world for crypto adoption. And just, you know, as a part of my job now, right? Like I have to pay attention to um, what governments around the world are doing with respect to crypto. And I think, you know, they're talking to each other, they're looking at it internally to see how they want to regulate it. I think this really is a borderless technology. And um, maybe that was one of the things that attracted me to it, just given my background. And, yeah. you know, I went to work, I mean, we can talk about this yeah, a little please, bit more let's later, go into that. but like, I was at the SEC and my first job out of the SEC was WorldCoin. Um, and one of the reasons I was really attracted to to that project was because, you know, their overall goal is to onboard as many people around the world onto Web3, you know, into the new digital economy as possible. Um, and that was that was something that um, really resonated with me. Well, I do want to talk about WorldCoin, but we'll save that till the end if we have time. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about sort of um, what you were doing right before you joined Bain Capital Crypto. Um, was that, was that, was that, um, how far before that were you at the SEC and tell us a little bit about what you were doing there and kind of like how that contributed to your going down the rabbit hole, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. I, so, you know, one of the things I love about this industry is that everyone sort of has their own unique journey into mm -hmm. getting, you know, what people call red pilled. Um, so, you know, I, after I graduated from law school, I had a pretty traditional legal career for a long time. 
Um, I worked for a law firm. I was doing financial regulatory and enforcement work, um, but advising traditional financial institutions and public companies like the JP Morgans of the world mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Um, but you know, that's where I, I uh, got a background in like everything from the securities laws to AML compliance and all of that. Anti-money laundering. Yeah, complex, exactly. Yeah. Anti-money laundering um, requirements and, you know, looking at broker dealers and banks and um, exchanges and, and having to learn, you know, all of the regulations that accompany all of that stuff. Um, so that, you know, that's what I did for years, very traditional legal work. Um, I clerked for a, year, for, for a year on the Southern District of New York, which mm -hmm. is the federal district court in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to go work for the SEC. I was there for about six years. Again, you know, in a lot of ways, a very traditional legal path. And yeah. I started out there doing, so I was a, an attorney in the enforcement division, which is the division at the SEC, which brings investigations. And then, you know, if the, the facts and the law warrant it, they'll actually go after individuals and companies for things like, um, I mean, there are all sorts of securities law violations, and I got to work on a variety of them. But, you know, things like fraud or misstatements or um, violating, you know, like broker dealer, um, like compliance requirements, things like that. Um, so that, I worked on that for my entire time in the uh -huh. enforcement division, but I was there at a really interesting time um, because in around 2017, the SEC started looking more closely at what were called initial coin offerings yes. or ICOs. Yes. Um, I still remember the day my supervisor came to me and was like, you know, there's this like project that we're seeing, um, they're offering like a cryptocurrency and they're like selling it to the public to raise all this money. They say they're gonna build this like protocol or something around it, but it doesn't look like anything's built yet. I'm not sure what they're telling these investors. Do you wanna work on this? And I was like, um, what's a cryptocurrency? Not really. <laughs> yeah, so no, actually I was like really okay, intrigued. Okay, okay, I thought okay, it was okay. really cool. So, you know, like it was 2017, so I had heard of Bitcoin. But other than that, I like had no idea what a blockchain was or uh -huh. how any of this stuff worked. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but I was like, sure, that sounds like cool, really cool, interesting cool. actually. Um, what so, was the name? What was the ICO if you, if you can share that? Um, okay, so I think I can share this because we eventually did Go charge after them. them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was block one. Okay, I'm yeah. oh, and absolutely. There, I mean, it was, I, I think even to date, it might still be the most money raised in an ICO. Yeah, with, with with a surprisingly small fine, yeah. but that's a, that's a separate. <laughs> yeah. That was very friendly um, with the SEC. Um, yeah, so that that was the first blockchain case or crypto case that I worked on there. Um, but yeah, so you know, I didn't know anything about yeah. the technology and just like cryptocurrency really in so general. So by the time you left there, how much of your work was focused on crypto and um, how did that lead you to uh, the opportunities at Bain? Not, I mean, only some of it. I okay. continue to work on just, you know, bread and butter securities law violations, like, you know, brokers in boiler rooms in Long Island ripping off retirees, like, around the country. So yeah, no. very, you know, like, standard SEC securities uh, law violations. And I, I, I mean, I loved that there was such a diversity of work. I never joined the crypto group. Okay. Um, I never joined the crypto group specifically for that reason because I did want to continue working on other types of cases, but I did crypto work and you know, I I read books and watched YouTube videos and did everything I could to like get up to speed on on the underlying technology and how a lot of, you know, these projects were raising money and and how these tokens worked and all of that. So that's how I got interested in it. Okay. The reason I finally decided to make the leap to the industry is because, you know, I said I was in the enforcement division for a while, yeah. so I was there for five years. Um, for my last like nine months at the SEC, I got a really cool opportunity to join the legislative and intergovernmental affairs office oh, nice. at the SEC. It's one of the offices at the SEC. I think it might actually be the only one that actually sit inside, sits inside the chair's office. Um, and the reason for that is because they basically oversee all of the SEC's engagement with the rest of the government, um, mainly Congress, but you know the White House, the Treasury Department, um, and then sometimes even state, you know, financial regulators. And so I was in that role in 2021, which was a really interesting time for blockchain 
like regulation and legislation because it was the year that I think in part because it was you know a bull market still, yeah. and there was just a lot of innovation happening. It was a very active time for the industry. Um, it was also the year that I think Congress started really paying attention to what was happening with crypto. Um, you know, th th there's always been like a handful of senators, like Senator Lummis, um, who have been interested in working on blockchain and blockchain potential blockchain leg legislation for years now. Um, but I think that year was the year when a lot more people started to pay attention. Yeah. And we're starting to think about, well, what should we do um, to better protect customers, but also give this industry a chance to, to keep innovating, yeah. right? Um, and so as a part of that role, what I got to do was, you know, if something touches at all on the capital markets or the SEC's mandate, um, a lot of times the Congress members who are introducing legislation, they'll send it to the SEC to get technical input mm -hmm. um, to find out, you know, like, what do you guys think of this? Mm -hmm. um, how is this going to impact the existing securities laws? How is this going to impact your ability to bring, you know, investigations? What are some unintended consequences of this legislation that maybe we're not appreciating? So they, they send it to the SEC to get their technical input. And so we would work with staff really just across the agency, right, depending on, on you know, if it, it touches like um, something that trading and markets you know has expertise in or the division of corporation finance or whatever it is so we worked with staff across the agency to help give input on a lot of, a lot of this legislation but because it was that year we were seeing a lot of draft legislation that touched on different parts of crypto and it was so much fun and it was so exciting and you know I think the environment the political environment around crypto was very different then right so yeah you know you have to remember that and so um, I just really wanted to be like more involved in that. I uh, love that. Just you know, so, like so, so. let's we we got, we got to make sure we get to what you got what you're doing today, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the bigger context. So let's jump ahead to um, when you joined uh, Bank Capital Crypto. Um, roughly when was that? And can you give just like a quick overview of what your uh, nine to five or whatever the hours might be while you're there? Like, what, what's your responsibility? <laughs> Um, so I joined last May, and this was uh, not too long after the fund was actually formed. Mm -hmm. So Bain Capital Crypto, um, it's a part of Bain Capital. Yep. It's Bain Capital's venture capital fund that only invests in blockchain-based projects. Okay. Um, you know, Bain Capital has a venture capital fund, and that fund was doing some blockchain and crypto investments going back to, I think, like 2014. Um, but obviously it's not like their focus. And so- Yeah, I remember when Bain made its earliest investments because uh, I was excited because they, they were like what we what we call like a, a tr mainstream uh, yeah. PC. Yeah. It, it was kind of like inbred back then. It was just crypto people investing in crypto people. And yeah. Bain was one of the first <laughs> kind of like non-crypto firms to start getting involved. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that, but they, they've been um, interested in it for a while. But um, so what is the what is the what does that demand look like? Like how big is the portfolio? I basically how, how much how much investment does a company have to make before they decide we're just going to break it off and do its own thing? Yeah, I mean, I I think you know it sort of moved in in line with the growing interest in innovation that you were seeing in mm -hmm. the crypto industry overall. I mean, I think eventually they realized that um, not only was crypto growing as an industry. Um, but it's also that like crypto projects need really specialized support, um, both from a technical perspective, but also, I mean, this is part of the reason they brought me on eventually. They also need very specialized support from like a regulatory and policy perspective, just given, you know, the state, the stage that the industry is in right now. It's very emerging. There's a lot of regulatory uncertainty, both in the U.S. and in jurisdictions all around the world. Um, and so I think they just thought it made sense to, to set up a fund that was just focused on crypto, just given the unique characteristics of um, And so you, you set me up nicely talking about the state <laughs> of um, the market now. Um, let's, for, for our audience that does not know, let's do a quick little 30 second overview of the current state of crypto regulation. A couple <laughs> major events have happened. Yes. Can we just do like some bullet items, like the two or three biggest events that have happened and um, maybe kind of like set the stage for the rest of our conversation with like, 
what were you, what were your portfolio companies' responses to that, and sort of like what kind of support are you providing as this is all unfolding? Yeah, so you know, as I mentioned earlier, the SEC really started looking at ICOs and specifically projects or companies that were issuing tokens. So token issuers, you know, they've been going after token issuers since 2017 when I was there, um, but lately the focus has turned more to intermediaries, meaning projects or companies that are providing services like trading um, and things like that, right? So last week, uh, the big news was that the SEC finally charged Binance, which is a crypto exchange that has both international operations and they have a US arm or a US entity, uh, and then Coinbase, which a lot of people have heard of. It's, it's uh, you know, one of the biggest crypto exchanges in the US. And it's actually a public company, meaning the SEC cleared them to offer their shares, meaning Coinbase stock, you know, to, to offer it to the public um, in 2021. So it's one of the, the few crypto companies in the US that have gone public, if not the only one, I can't even think of another one. Um, so that's what happened last week, is that the SEC finally charged them with acting as uh, unregistered exchanges, brokers, and clearing agents. And I say finally because this is, had kind of been expected for a while. Um, and, you know, they've been in, the, the companies have both disclosed that they've been under SEC investigation for a while, and so this was not unexpected. So it's not unexpected now for people that have been paying attention. Um, when you think back to your time in 2017, 2018, at the end of your tenure there working at the intergovernmental um, uh, program, um, it sounds to me like you were, at least in some ways, participating in the SEC's learning curve process as they were understanding the technology, understanding how it fits into traditional finance. Um, when you think back to those times and you think back to what that learning experience felt like, um, and what your peers were saying and talking and the questions they were asking. Um, does the eventual decision to go after Binance and Coinbase the way that they did surprise you compared to what that was like? In, in other words, might there have been a different future? Were, were you, was your mind open to the possibility that it could have gone another way? Or did you see this coming years ago? So two things, I think the crypto industry was very different in 2017 than it is now. I think, you know, it's it was the case back then that a lot of these projects and teams were raising money for things that didn't necessarily exist yet. Um, so they were, you know, they were giving these tokens out and taking money from the public. Um, but it was unclear whether the tokens had a use or would ever have a use. And of course, you did see a lot of scams where people raised money from the public, they gave out these tokens, and then they just took the money and ran with it, right? Mm -hmm. And it was impossible to The narrative to tell back that. then being that these tokens had a use. They were called utility coins. Yeah. Um, and the, the thinking was that the fact that they had a use meant that they were somehow intrinsically different than the pieces of paper that were traditionally traded as securities. And that narrative created a lot of cover for uh, companies that ended up being determined to be running securities as regulators were, and then the rest of the world were trying to figure out if these tokens actually were going to do anything. Is that kind of an accurate summary? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that was what, you know, when we were there, I think that's what we were trying to get a handle on. Yeah. It's like, what did this all mean? Um, are these real projects? And if they are, you know, and they're, essentially raising capital to build whatever they're claim, they claim they're going to build, that does look a lot like a securities offering, yeah. right? It's a capital raise um, with, without necessarily giving the public the disclosures that they need to make sure that the project's not just gonna do like a rug pull, which is when you raise all this money and then you run away with the money. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that obviously was something that we were taking seriously at the time. Um, but I think what happened over time is that real applications, real p protocols, real networks really did start um, to be built. And, and then it became more clear that a lot of these tokens actually did have real utility, Yeah. right? I mean, there's obviously a secondary market for these tokens where people buy them. Um, but tokens have a lot of uses outside of that. They 
you know, a lot of times if they're native to like a, a protocol, meaning like a blockchain, mm -hmm. um, the token might be the only way that someone who is helping to maintain that blockchain, meaning validating transactions and adding to the ledger, um, that's the only way that they can get paid for it, right? They get paid for do for providing that service through a mining reward, or um, or through validating, right? So that is that's a utility for the token. It has nothing to do with speculation or, or investment purposes. Um, it could be the only way that you can pay for a good or a service through an application on that protocol. Yeah. Um, it can be a way if you're a token holder and you're a part of say a you know, uh, it's called a DAO, a, a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, a lot of, a lot of protocols and applications are run by DAOs because they are attempting to become decentralized. So, if you're a token holder and a member of this DAO, you can vote and participate in decisions about what happens with the protocol or application through holding that token. So, it's a way to help govern. Um, the protocol or the application. That's another use that a token could have. So we, you know, like this is sort of what's happened over the years, right? It, it's become more clear that tokens can have a lot of utility mm -hmm. and there can be a lot of different functionality associated with a token. And so I think that's what makes it very different than a traditional security. Do um, you have, um, I know this is a difficult question, but I have to ask a direct question every now and then, right? Um, do you have a personal um, measurement for like security, no security uh, beyond the Howey test that everyone has access to? Yeah. Um, like when when you look at something, do you say, okay, this is how for for myself and for Bain, like we're going to work on this asset as if it was a security or we're going to work on this asset as if it was not a security. Like how much of that question ends up relying on questions of use? How much of that question ends up relying on questions of distribution and sort of like how do you balance that to figure out what you're how you're going to handle an asset? Yeah. I mean, that you know, this is the question. Yeah. Right? It's sort of the question that has really um like everyone is sort of struggling to figure out like what is the mental model for that? And, you know, I think it helps a lot to sort of go back to first principles, meaning what are the securities laws designed to do, yeah. right? It's a, when it comes to issuers of tokens of traditional stocks, like the purpose of the securities laws is to make sure that the public is getting the information that they need when they're making the decision to. Yeah to invest in a stock or a company or something like that. Um, and so a lot of what the securities registration and disclosure regime is designed to do is to eliminate information asymmetries that might advantage insiders, meaning management or people who work at the company. Like if they have information that the public doesn't have, but that information is material to a potential investment decision, um, then the company needs to disclose that information, yeah. right? That's the whole purpose of the securities laws and the disclosure regime. And so I think one useful way to look at it is, if you have a token project, um, are there information asymmetries, right? Is it still very centralized? Meaning, is there a development team or like a founding team that has a lot of information about the token or about the protocol or the application that could affect the value of the token um, that they're not sharing with the public? Or has the project reached a point where there aren't those, those sorts of information asymmetries, meaning there's no longer um, a centralized team that has all of this inside information that it's not sharing, right? Like maybe it's so decentralized yeah. because at, at a certain point because there's a DAO with like thousands of token holders who are collectively, you know, considering information and then making governance decisions like there's yeah. no there's no longer like the equivalent of a management team at like a corporation like Apple or something um, that's making those decisions and so I, I do think how decentralized a network is matters a lot to whether um, there should be a need to comply with some sort of disclosure regime or even like the practical ability to right yeah. like some networks are so decentralized at this point that there there literally is no like management team that could even make these disclosures. So there's also the practical question of how would you even comply? I, and when, when you talk about information asymmetry and you talk about sort of um, transparency, uh, it, it sounds 
very uh, kindred with some of the early crypto ideologies where the idea was to kind of, um, you know, take information out of control of big bad technology and put it in the hands of the people. And I remember in the early days, there seemed to be some really good faith, faith efforts by these companies, these organizations that were raising capital to be transparent. Um, that they, they would, you know, want to raise 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars. They would re release a tokenomics report showing exactly where the tokens were going to go. There was a, a, a lot of transparency. Um, I, I will say it seemed that that got less and less as the years went on. Um, and some of that good faith efforts um, seemed to go by the wayside. Um, nevertheless, I think that like the principles that you're describing uh, are kind of a win-win. I, I, it's, it's hard to imagine a, a world where a society wouldn't want that. Um, and I think that to a large degree, um, Gary Gensler and, and the, the, the current uh, SEC regulators have kind of leaned on the fact that like those principles are universal. Um, we don't need to rewrite anything. We don't need to change anything. Our job is still the same. We are protecting in the same way that we always have. Um, there are, in fact, some interesting differences. Um, and I think that you're kind of in a very um, rare position, if not in some ways unique position, to kind of talk about some of those differences. Um, when you hear um, Gary and, and others sort of so somewhat casually and, and maybe even flippantly say, like, we don't need new regulation, the old stuff works fine. Like, what are the one or two biggest areas where you're like, yeah, Gary, no? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, one thing that we think about a lot um, in you know the community of lawyers and policy people is, um, you know, what sorts of regulations actually make sense for the unique characteristics of tokens and not just tokens, but like different parts of the crypto ecosystem too. Right? Yeah, the, the settlement exchange, process. Any, yeah, so um, tokens are very different than traditional securities in a lot of ways. Yeah. So you know some of the things that I mentioned earlier, right, where tokens can have different utility and different different functionality. If you're talking about disclosures and you know if you're just out there thinking about well which tokens do I want to invest in, you know, is there a team behind it? How does how does the protocol associated with the token work or the application associated with the token work? All of these all of that information is not necessarily the kind of information that is required in a typical registration statement. Um, if you're talking about like a company or a corporation that wants to go public and offer its shares of stock to the public. Um, you know, tokens have a lot of characteristics that are different, right? So like one, one piece of information that might be useful to a potential token purchaser or token investor is what governance rights are associated with this token. Yeah. Right? That's something that is not relevant to a traditional corporate security, but it's very relevant um, potentially to a to a token purchaser. Um, what about looking at the, these these big headlines that we saw recently with, uh, we'll focus on Coinbase specifically, where they were getting in trouble for not running one unlicensed entity, but basically lacking three licenses. Um, uh, the, the securities license, a, a brokerage license, and a settlement license, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so I, it's an ex they, so the SEC is saying so for both Coin, Coinbase and Binance yeah. that they were operating as an unregistered exchange. So an exchange meaning like the New York Stock Exchange or Nasdaq in the traditional securities context, they both are registered as national securities exchanges um, with the SEC, which yeah. they're required to do under the securities laws. Um, the other thing the SEC is alleging is that Coinbase and Binance were not registered as brokers. Um, and then the third charge is that they were not registered as clearing agents. And, so. and that's fine in the traditional financial world. Those three licenses exist for a reason, as does the separation. Um, there are certain um, controls put in place to make sure that insider trading is more difficult, et cetera. Um, but tell me a little bit about sort of like, I'm gonna just say it what, what, it, what it is, like the, the tone deafness of um, that complaint against a crypto trading company. How is it that the, the nature of these assets is different in such a way that 
at least some of those licenses are, are being combined into a single service. So what makes blockchain and trading crypto on a blockchain different, or one of the things that makes it different and, and what's really innovative about it is that you get real-time settlement, meaning you know, you can, you can buy or sell a crypto asset on the blockchain basically instantaneously, and you can do it seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, that obviously is not the case in the traditional securities context, right? In the traditional securities context, um, one of the reasons why you have so many, so many intermediaries, so you have a broker, this is how most people do trading. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. have a broker, you place your order with a broker, and then it goes through a lot of different steps, right? So the broker will usually, um, they'll usually place the order with a national securities exchange, like the New York Stock Exchange. Not This is not always how it happens, but just in general. They'll place the order with a national securities exchange, like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Um, and then the securities has to go through a process of clearance and settlement. And there's this thing called the Depository um, Trust Corporation. It's right up the street yeah, from us, so actually. They, so <laughs> what they do is they clear the trades. And, and literally, it used to be paper stock certificates, yeah. and the DTCC was created um, to, because basically brokers and the whole system got overwhelmed with you know the the system of having to literally like transfer paper uh -huh. stock certificates so they created the DTC DT, DTCC so that the DTC all they had to do was just basically change an enter entry in their ledger to record the transfer of ownership of stocks they didn't physically move anywhere. exactly yeah and the reason one of the reasons it takes two days or more to actually affect a trade is because they have to make sure that the security, so whatever the asset is, is actually delivered and that on the other side, the money is actually paid, right? So it's, a lot of it is like has to be physically done. So it just works very differently in a traditional securities context. On a blockchain, it happens almost instantaneously. The transfer of ownership of a crypto token, moving from one wallet to another wallet, um, happens like within seconds. So which of just the by nature of the technology? Which of the two licenses kind of like merges into a single service? I mean, the SEC is alleging that a crypto exchange um, like Coinbase and like Binance, they're saying that they're really doing all three of these things, right? So what's interesting, and I think what's important to keep in mind about these charges is that the SEC isn't just saying that they failed to to um, become registered as each of these three things. They're also saying no one entity should be engaged in all three of these functions, including um, for reasons, for one of the reasons you just mentioned, which is there could be conflicts of interest that yeah. harm customers. Um, but in the blockchain context, in order to preserve real-time settlement, which is you know one of the, the key innovations of blockchain, you can't separate those functions because then you just end up with like T plus two without necessarily it being clear what risks you're designed, uh, what risks you're trying to mitigate or address, like, like the separation and the multiple intermediaries. Um, the reason it's required in the traditional securities context is because of risks like I mentioned, right? There could be a failure to actually deliver the security on the one hand or the asset um, with the other party. And so that, that sort of risk doesn't exist in the blockchain context. Um, and so it's unclear why you would need to separate the, the broker, broker function from the exchange fun function from the clearance function. Is it going too far to say that requiring a company to do that undermines all of the technological breakthrough of the assets? Well, you would completely lose out on real-time settlement, again, without it being clear what risks you're trying to solve for. Um, and so I think this is one of the reasons why an alternative approach that you know the regulator could have taken is to say, okay, digital assets are different. Um, and the way that they're traded is different, meaning the way that these platforms operate, platforms like Coinbase, is different from you know what we see in the traditional context where we need all of these intermediaries and, and it takes like days to settle a trade. Um, they're different. How can we regulate them in a way that still preserves the benefits 
um, of blockchain and the way that blo crypto assets are traded, like real-time settlement, mm -hmm. um, while still thinking about some of the risks that might be unique to blockchain, right? Yeah. So like one risk that, that, that does exist in the context of a crypto exchange that doesn't exist in the tra traditional securities context is, um, I mean, this is, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? When you affect a transaction on the blockchain, it's irreversible. Yeah. So, you know, if something, if you, if you actually accidentally send a trade in error, there's no way to reverse that without basically having to do like the opposite trade. Yeah. Like you'd have to just do a whole new transaction. Yeah. In the traditional securities context, in part because there is that time lag, um, it can be reversed, right? So that, that's an example actually of why special regulations or like tailored regulations are necessary in the crypto context because there there aren't just like benefits and innovation that you're trying to preserve like real time settlement there actually are unique risks that need to be addressed in crypto right and so it's like both to be clear um, the the lawsuits uh, are an ongoing matter um, there are a many ways this could play out from the judicial side, from a congressional side. Um, we won't get into all those details because I know you're not a fortune teller. Um, but uh, to kind of wrap things up here, um, as we are waiting to see how this is all going to play out, um, there are real world impacts that are happening on some of the businesses, more than just Coinbase and Binance. Um, I was reading this morning that uh, Robinhood had a 68% drop in its crypto volume over the last quarter. Um, I can only imagine that folks at Robinhood and other companies are coming up with emergency plans, um, figuring out how to get through this period. Uh, well, fingers crossed that it, re it resolves well for them, but maybe they have to go outside the United States. Um, you've got a, a, a good sized portfolio company, you've invested in a lot of companies in the space. What are sort of like one or two rules of thumb that you might give to um, executives at other crypto companies and looking to do business or already doing business in the United States as they kind of like get ready for the long haul here? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's such a tough and frustrating spot to be in. So, you know, not just companies like Robinhood, which, you know, they made the decision to delist three of the crypto tokens that they used to offer that were named in the SEC complaint, um, complaints. And you know, these these token issuers themselves were not named in the, com in the complaints, right? Yeah. So just to clarify that, they weren't actually named, but as a part of the allegations against Binance and Coinbase, the SEC is alleging that these were some of the tokens yeah. that were unregistered securities and being offered by these exchanges. And so, you know, companies like Robinhood are left in this really, I think, difficult position um, in deciding you know, well, the SEC is saying that these tokens are unregistered securities. They haven't charged the tokens directly, but that could happen. And so, you know, they have to think about, well, you know, what's our risk tolerance for this? And there's still a lot of regulatory uncertainty. What should we do? I think it's very frustrating for companies like that. And then it's obviously difficult for early stage companies, like the ones that make up our portfolio. Um, you know, whether they've already launched a token or are planning to as a part of the protocol or the application or the network that they're building, they also have to think about, you know, the regulatory uncertainty that exists in the US and, and also looking abroad and seeing a lot of other jurisdictions are actually coming up with regulatory frameworks that will allow not just token issuers, but all sorts of crypto service providers, like a crypto exchange like Coinbase, um, to come into compliance. They're saying, we recognize that there's innovation here. And, you know, in some cases they're saying we want our country to be a hub for yeah. Web3 and for, for, you know, to attract companies and businesses. Like one of the, some of the news that came out yesterday is Andreessen, the, the big venture capital firm is opening its first non-US office yeah. in the UK and the prime minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak put out a statement, you know, affirming that they are committed to being a hub for Web3 innovation and welcoming companies like Andreessen to come and to build and to invest in UK-based startups and founders and, and that technology. Um, I, I and can't help but think, uh, just a quick follow-up there, um, 
we definitely have seen uh, G Gemini recently announced that it was going to be moving its headquarters, or at least its European headquarters, uh, to Ireland. Um, it seems to be a very strong indication that they're considering moving their actual headquarters there. Um, we've seen both Coinbase, Gemini, Binance, many other exchanges uh, launching distributed exchanges that maybe have a little bit of um, influence outside of U.S. regulation, though that's a big maybe. And we've also seen some movements to self-custody. Um, when you are talking to your portfolio companies, is there one or two like concrete um, tips that you're giving as sort of like making sure that you can keep your doors open while this change is happening? Yeah, I mean, one thing that we are talking to them more, more about, in part because they're you know, they have a lot of questions about, you know, if we're planning to launch a token, um, where's a good place to do that yeah. right now, right? So, for instance, the EU uh, just passed Mika, which is their really comprehensive landmark crypto um, legislation. And it really covers so many different parts of the crypto ecosystem. It gives a path to compliance for token issuers. It gives a path to compliance for crypto platforms. They call them... Um, crypto asset service providers, so CASPs, and it says, you know, we're not going to try to fit you or shoehorn you into like our existing financial regulations, because that can that can vary so much between the different states within the EU. We're actually just going to create a whole new framework that we think makes sense for um, the unique benefits and risks of crypto. Um, and so uh, I think a lot of our portfolio companies are looking at that and saying, you know, instead of living under this environment of uncertainty where you don't just have the regulators um, bringing enforcement actions and also just not knowing what they're going to do next, right? I think there's an element of arbitrariness to this that is really frustrating. Yeah. Meaning, you know, Coinbase lists like what, over 100 tokens? Why It's sort of unclear why the SEC chose to go after, I think it was 13 yeah, of them, so. right? So it's very stressful to be operating in that environment where you you're not really sure what the regulators are gonna do next. I mean, I think there's some really encouraging activity uh, in Congress to pass something that's like Mika. I mean, you know, we have, we have a very idiosyncratic and in a lot of ways really complex financial regulatory system in the US. And so I think most of the legislation that we've seen tries to work within that existing framework, which is fine, I mean, you know, um, every country needs to take the approach that they think makes the most sense for them and also has the most chance of actually getting passed into law. I mean, there's a practical aspect. You so there's been too, so right? much but regulation introduced over the years with the, uh, the hope of preempting something like this happening. Yeah. Almost none of it has been passed. Um, people are shopping around. They're looking for other jurisdictions to build in. But uh, hope is not over in the United States. No. Uh, beyond um, possible judicial or congressional solutions, um, let's let's wrap it up with just a little bit look to the future. There was a uh, was it a financial infrastructure bill that recently um, surfaced. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about this financial infrastructure bill that's currently underway. Um, what might happen next, and for people who care, if they want to get involved, like what can they do? Yeah, so this, it's a, a really, I think, landmark market structure bill. Market structure, yeah, thank you. That the yeah. House just introduced. And it's kind of like the closest thing that we've had so far to something like Mika in the EU. It's very ambitious, it's like over 160 pages. Basically what it does is set up a dual registration system between the SEC and the CFTC, which are two of the major financial regulators that we have that um, regulate securities and commodities, respectively. So there's a lot more nuance to this, but the basic idea is that when a token starts out, it's life. It uh, is under SEC jurisdiction. It has to reg register and make disclosures that you know make sense for crypto. Um, and then as it becomes more decentralized um, and reaches a point of decentralization, then it comes under CFTC jurisdiction. And the CFTC can create what's called a digi digital commodity exchange. So this is a whole new category that doesn't exist under financial regulations right now. It can create this digital commodity exchange, which is basically something like Coinbase. And then those tokens can trade on that platform and be 
um, regulated by the CFTC as a commodity. Fascinating. That's that's the gist of it. But obviously, it's there's a lot more nuance in it. It's a it's a big ambitious bill, but I think it's a really really positive step in the right direction. Well, like I always say, I don't have a horse in the game. Um, don't invest in the space. But from a storytelling perspective, that sounds like a great story it makes to sense, tell, right? right? Yeah. So let's hope that happens. <laughs> yeah. At least from a writing stress. perspective. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> Funk V, it was such a pleasure to get to know you a little bit. We really appreciate you coming down and hanging out. I'm looking forward to seeing what Bain Capital Crypto does in the future. Great. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you.